What a great blessing. Thank you to the Burtner sisters and to the great worship team this week. We're proud of you. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to Genesis chapter 50, we're continuing our series called Summer Stories, Contemporary Lessons from Old Testament Bible Characters. And maybe just by way of review, you remember Noah. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about Noah's unsinkable faith, that, that Noah built an ark in a desert for 120 years and it hadn't rained before. And I'm just praying that God would grant us that same kind of faith. I know, I know that this is such a challenging time for so many and particularly maybe even for you right now. But I want to remind you that it won't last for 120 years. It won't. We won't have to do this for 120 years because by then we'll be with the Lord. And then we remember Abraham's faith. It was, it was, it was the, the faith in the impossible promise of God, like, 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 like faith for the impossible. And maybe you remember this too. Abraham believed God, even though the promise that God had made that through Isaac, the nations of the world would be blessed, seemed to not be possible. Like he, couldn't, he couldn't bring these two things together with the command that God said that you sacrifice Isaac. And so we do the same thing. We're operating on the promise, even though we're hearing we can't meet as a church in the way that we would typically want to meet. And yet we continue believing that Jesus will build his church. So we're encouraged by that. But today's Bible character, Joseph, it's probably far more personal for all of us. I've titled this message, The Faith to Forgive. And what we see in the life of, life of Joseph is a man who was badly, badly treated by his own brothers, hurt by them, sold as a slave, left for dead, told their father that he was dead. And then Joseph, because of that, ends up in Potiphar's household and is falsely accused by Potiphar's wife and ends up in jail. But before the whole story's over, right, he's, he's actually the second most powerful man on the planet running Egypt, and he ends up saving the people of Israel. Because remember, that promise that God made to Abraham was going to be fulfilled, and he's using Joseph to preserve this people to bring the Messiah. But all of us have been hurt, right? All of us have been, been treated poorly or betrayed by somebody that we love. Who's, who's hurt you? How is it that we can get over that hurt? How can our hearts not become bitter? The key is, is forgiveness, but it's hard. Listen to this from Luke chapter 17, verses 4 and 5. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. I love that. What, what is Jesus saying? He's just going, you need to forgive, but it's going to be hard. And the apostle's immediate reaction is, wow, that is so hard. It's going to require God's help. Increase our faith. They were going to have to entrust themselves to God if they were going to be able to forgive. Maybe you feel that way today as well, that you're finding it hard to, to forgive. You know, I had uh, Googled this week the hardest things to do, looking for a sermon illustration. And what came back to me was instead the hardest things on the planet. And, and, and apparently the, most, the hardest thing that's naturally occurring on our planet is a diamond. That's why it's kind of scratch proof. But what I would say to you is there's something harder on this planet than a diamond, and it's a heart that's full of bitterness as the result of unforgiveness. John MacArthur wrote this two years ago. There is so much hostility in the human heart that it is literally erupting. And if not controlled, it will totally destroy the world. I think we feel that today. There's so much anger in our cancel culture. It is a conflagration like no other, a deadly kind of violence that is threatening to bury the land in an avalanche of vengeance and violence. And so we see that, that there seems to be this volcanic eruption of anger that is happening in our world, a bitterness, a desire to make people pay. But what's more dangerous than that is if that volcanic eruption happens in our own hearts and our lives. I can't control what's going on in the culture, but I can control what goes on in my heart. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, the Bible says this, See to it that no one misses the grace of God, so no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Who's hurt you? Who do you need to forgive? You see, the consequence of unforgiveness is bitterness, and that bitterness is not limited to just us. Did you catch the last part of Hebrews 12, 15? That, that others will be defiled. 
angry hearts produce awful results. You know people who are bitter. You know people who carry themselves in an angry way. Have grace on them. They've probably been hurt. But also I would encourage you to walk in grace yourself so that your heart isn't bitter, to walk in forgiveness. Jesus said this on the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the pure of heart. Blessed are the pure of heart. The word pure there is the same word we get for catheter, actually. And it's interesting. It's, it's, it, a catheter, as we're aware of medically, is a drain that's inserted, a hose that's inserted into somebody's body to drain off in purity. And so it irrigates off impurities. And what I would say is, is that all of us need that same kind of irrigation. It was in 1990 uh, that I was running busy, finishing my college degree and getting ready for a full-time job. And, and I asked my sweet wife, Kristen, to, to take our car into the mechanic. And, and I said, you, if you could call and make an appointment to get a new catalytic converter put in our car. And she called there and, and, and instead of saying catalytic converter, she said, I need a catheter for my, for my Chevy Chevette. And that just made the mechanics just burst into laughter at her. I felt so bad. And when she went in, they had spread the word all around the shop. And here's the lady who needs a new catheter for her car. And while that was a funny experience that happened when she was 20 years old, we're over it now. What is not funny is when our hearts become hard, and there's not any way for that to drain off. We need a catheter for our heart spiritually, especially in this area of bitterness. We do. And God has provided such an instrument, and it is forgiveness. Forgiveness is God's gift to us and for us. And so we see in our story today, if you look at Genesis chapter 50, a man who refused to be bitter, but chose to forgive. In fact, look at, if you will, in Genesis 50, verse 15, it says, When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back. So Jacob has died, and what they assume is this, is this brother that they sold as a slave, the only reason he's restrained himself from punishing them is because Jacob is still alive. And so that when he, they think when that restraint's over, he's going to get us. And he says he'll pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. They know it was wrong what they did. And then in verse 16, so they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Doubtful that Jacob ever gave this command. But verse 17, say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of God of your, the God of your father. So they're, they're pleading with him forgiveness. Now catch this, a forgiveness that they've already received. They just didn't believe it. And then notice Joseph's response. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Verse 18, his brothers also came to him and fell down before him and said, behold, we are your servants, we're your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant it for evil, against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Let me just pray before we dive into our passage. Father, I pray this morning that you would soften hearts. Father, set us free from the prison of unforgiveness and bitterness. Thank you for this hopeful example of faith in the life of Joseph. May you grant us similar faith to forgive. In Jesus' name, amen. There are three things that I want to share with you that I think will help all of us drain off the impurity of bitterness from our hearts. Number one is we must have the faith that you are forgiven. You must have the faith that you are forgiven. Do you believe it? Do you believe that God has really forgiven you of all of your sins. You see, the brothers, when they were coming to Joseph, they said, would you please forgive us? But 17 years previously, in Genesis chapter 45, he already had forgiven them, and they wept, and they made up. But apparently that whole time, they thought Joseph was just a hypocrite, that he really hadn't released them from that liability. 
You see, one of the requirements to really forgive others is that you have to receive God's forgiveness to you. The brothers came and said, we'll be your servants, we'll be your slaves. And Joseph wept. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, every single sin you ever have committed, and certainly in my case, that sin is immense. And the truth is, in your case as well. And yet, God has released you from that debt. Jesus paid the price for you. I know it doesn't feel like it's fair. Like that person hurt me. Why should I forgive them? That's not fair. But really remember this, God's not always fair. He's always just, but he's not always fair. What would have been fair is if I had paid the penalty for my own sins by going to hell for all of eternity. But Jesus instead pays my debt in my place. He is just in that to forgive my sins, somebody had to pay, but Jesus paid for me. I'm not a big fisherman. I like to go fishing. I'm going to go fishing in a couple of weeks with my son-in-law. Jake loves fishing, and so therefore I love fishing more now than ever because I like to spend time with him. But I don't love fishing, and when I do catch a fish, I always throw it back. Why? I don't even like to eat fish. It's not totally true. I like fish sticks, but you know what I mean. It's got to have a lot of batter on it. And so, so I always throw it back. Now, sadly, oftentimes the fish float back because I'm not even good at taking out the hooks. I usually kill them when I'm trying to release them. But what the Bible tells us is this, is that forgiveness is really a release. It's a release from liability. It's taking somebody off the hook and letting them go free. That's what God has done for us. And nobody has offended me as much as I have forgiven God, and yet he has released me. Listen to Psalm 103, a beloved verse in the Bible. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Completely removed from us. In fact, later on in Psalm 103, it says this, He does not treat us as our sins deserve. I don't get what I deserve. Instead, I receive his grace. When you put your faith in Jesus, your sins are completely forgiven but you're also forfeiting the right to take revenge. You're forfeiting the right to be unforgiving. Because for me not to forgive somebody else, no matter how badly they've hurt me, is hypocritical on my part. It's not, it's not a matter of how much forgiveness the other person deserves. It's really more a matter of how much freedom do you want. We not only are obligated to forgive because we've been forgiven, but honestly, we get to forgive, so we're not held captive any longer. Who's hurt you? Who do you need to forgive? Remember what Jesus prayed in the Lord's Prayer? Do you remember it? He said this, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. So really what he's saying is this, is God will just forgive you to the degree that you desire to forgive other people. How much do you want God to forgive you? Forgive others the same way. Now, I must pause here for a moment and tell you that forgiveness does not equal reconciliation. Reconciliation takes two parties coming together. It's not what I'm talking about. Forgiveness is you just releasing somebody else from liability. The second thing that we learn from Joseph's life is that we must have the faith that God will take care of it. We have to have the faith that God will take care of it. Did you see there what he said to his brothers in verse 19? But Joseph said to them, Am I in the place of God? So they're saying, they're begging for him not to retaliate against them, not to take vengeance. And Joseph's response is, I'm not in the place of God. When we hold on to vengeful thoughts against others, when we desire to make somebody else pay, really what we're doing is, is we're saying we're God and we are the judge, but we're not. Joseph had good theology. He knew that God was sovereign and that he could even use the sinful actions of somebody else to accomplish a better work. But he also knew that God was the ultimate judge and that that's not our job. Listen to Romans chapter 12, verse 18. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So often we want to bury the hatchet in the back of the person who has hurt us. Somebody has said this, unforgiveness is the poison that we drink hoping that others will die. 
Have you ever been in the store and you see somebody else's kid behaving badly and you want to discipline them? Have you, ever, have you ever done that before? Like I remember I worked at Sears for five years before I ever came up here to the Antelope Valley in 1991. And, and one time there was a, a kid there in the toy aisle and, and my job was to tend to that part of the store. And this kid was just demolishing the toy aisle. Like kid, you know, just throwing toys out on the floor and I'm trying to clean up after him. And finally I decide as a 20 year old young man that I, I probably need to correct him. So I just say, hey, you know, please don't, don't, don't destroy the store like that. Please just don't touch the toys. And the kid came over to me, about a seven-year-old, and kicked me in the shins as hard as he could. And I just thought, oh, this kid needs correction. And the temptation was like, I'm going to discipline him. But if I had, how would that have gone over with his mom? You see, his mom would have said, you have no right to discipline my child. And you know what? She is correct about that. She was failing at her job to do that, no doubt, but it wasn't my job to take her place. You know, God is the creator of all humans, and ultimately, he is the judge. And so we must leave it to him to do his work. Do you believe that God's promise to judge will be fulfilled? That we can leave it to the wrath of God? Jesus believed that. That's crazy, right? Jesus, the second person of the Trinity. And yet it says this, when they hurled their insults at him in 1 Peter chapter 2, he did not retaliate, but he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. See, Jesus could just, on that cross, he could say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He could be at peace like that, not be overcome by bitterness for the unjust treatment he was receiving. He could respond in love. Why was he able to do that? Because simply... He entrusted that judgment to the Father. If Jesus can do that, so can I. Joseph did it. We should too. The third thing is this, is we must have faith to bless those who have hurt you. We have to have faith. We have to have faith to bless those who have hurt us. Who's hurt you? How can you bless them? How can you pray for them? Notice in verse 21 of Genesis 50, what does Joseph do? So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So he comforted them. He says, I'm going to actually bless you and provide for you. Notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, 44. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. What he said right before that is this, as you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who, who persecute you. In fact, later in verse 46, he says this, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and he sends rain on the just and the unjust. When we have beautiful weather here in the Antelope Valley, you know who else enjoys the beautiful weather? Everybody who calls the prison their home. God is kind to all. God sends rain for all. God gives his provision for all. God was kind to me when I was still a sinner. Christ died for me and he died for you. And so Jesus sets the bar even higher. And I just want to tell you that is not a natural human reaction. In order to love those who've hurt you, you have to have a new heart. You have to have been born again received a new heart from the Lord. Romans 5 says that he's poured his love into our hearts, that I'm to be a conduit of his love, even for those who are unlovely. And so you might say today, sure, I'll pray for those who have hurt me. I'll just pray. I won't pray that they die, but I'll pray that they have a chronic case of kidney stones or, or, or maybe a permanent case of plantar fasciitis. So every time they take a step, their foot hurts. Or maybe just an incurable, ingrown toenail. I mean, not, 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 not anything to, to kill them, but that's not what Jesus says. Pray for their repentance. Pray that God would bless them. Be like Joseph, who spoke kindly, even to those who desired to kill them. And what does Jesus say? Then you will be like your Father in heaven, because God acts like that. So we'll have a family resemblance. I like what Alistair Begg says. He says this, Joseph is a classic expression of genuine faith. Because he bore the family likeness, being kind to his ungrateful and wicked brothers. We are called to do the same, being kind to those who have offended us. This is a high calling. We cannot do this on our own. It requires 
faith. Trust that God will provide that kind of love because we so want to be like our dad in heaven. You know, I, I was uh, sitting with my daughters uh, a couple weeks ago in, in our family room, and Brianna was there and Hannah. I love both of them so dearly. And they were having a conversation that I got to listen in on, and it was fascinating to me, and it blessed my heart. But they were talking about the different characteristics that they've gotten from me. And they're both very close, but they're far different. Different personalities, different skills. And and Brianna was like, I think I got this half of dad, and Hannah, I think you got the other half of dad. And regardless of what it is they were talking about, I was flattered, I was encouraged. And it got me to thinking, like, how much more so does our Heavenly Father look from heaven and just go, man, when we exhibit His character traits, when, we, when we're like Him, how much does He delight in that? When we love our enemies, when we pray for those who persecute us, how much is God just going, I'm so proud of Him right now? I, I, I want to take you back where we started today to Ephesians chapter 4 and look at verse 32 again. This is so important, this connection. Be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. So that's the standard. But look at the next verse. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. You catch the connection there? Now, we don't often make that connection because Ephesians 4.32 in your Bible is kind of, you feel like it's an end and the next chapter starts in chapter 5, verse 1. So be kind to each other, tender-hearted toward one another, forgive each other. And then the next verse is, and be imitators of God as beloved children. In other words, act like your dad in heaven. Act like who you are. You see, those numbers weren't in the original Bible. They were added later, and they're helpful. helps us find verses. But it's not helpful when it po- causes us to pause and not connect to the verse right above it. What he's really saying is this. Is you want to be like your dad in heaven? You want to make your daddy proud in heaven? Love like he loves. Be tenderhearted. Forgive one another as God in Christ forgave you. John MacArthur has said this, forgiveness is required of a believer because forgiveness is the most God-like act a Christian can do. No act is more divine than forgiveness. Never are we more like God than when we forgive. I'm not in any way wanting to minimize the hurt that has been caused in your life by others. And I'm certainly not wanting you to feel like today that, that, that God doesn't see your hurt. Joseph certainly recognizes that they had done evil against him, that the evil that you've done against me, it's, it's not minimizing, it's not ignoring the hurt. It's facing the hurt and choosing to forgive. It doesn't promise reconciliation. Clearly, to this point for 17 years, the brothers really hadn't reconciled with Joseph. They suspected that he was just waiting for dad to die. But I will say this, while forgiveness does not change the past, it does hold great promise for the future. You may even need to, in your heart, forgive somebody who's not even alive anymore. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe it's somebody who violated and hurt you. Maybe it's somebody that you'll never necessarily see again. But God has given you this great catheter for your heart so that your heart can be pure to drain off that bitterness. And so today we need to pray, God, increase our faith, increase our faith that that you would purify our hearts, that you would help us to forgive others who have hurt us, that, that we would have the faith that we have been forgiven. And I hope you know that grace today. God has completely separated your sin from you if you've put your faith in Jesus. It wasn't fair, but he's done it in a just way. He sent his son to die in our place. That to have the faith that God can handle it, that I don't need to be God, that God's got it. He's going to make sure that all accounts are settled. And I'll just leave that to him. And then thirdly, the faith to bless those who have hurt you. There might not be a tangible way you can do that, but if there is, I encourage you to do that. But certainly you can pray for those. Your attitude of your heart can be one of benevolence toward that person. And maybe God then in the future will provide that opportunity. But today we can learn something from the life of Joseph. We can learn that that through the faith to forgive, we can be free from bitterness. Blessed are the pure of heart. I pray this morning that, that each of you would experience the grace of God's forgiveness for you, but also God's grace to you for the ability to forgive others so that you can be set free.
It's not about how much they deserve your forgiveness. The question is really how free do we want to be? Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Joseph, for this great example we have. Give us the faith to forgive this day. Lord, would you bless those who are watching on now with a real freedom, Lord, would they experience your grace toward them? And Lord, Lord, I pray that grace would flow through them. Father, drain our hearts of any impurities. I pray in Jesus.